Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Characterizing Viruses from Deadly Pathogens to the Workhorses of Gene Therapy. I'm Ross Verheul of Beckman Culture Life Sciences, and I'll be moderating today's live event. Today's educational webinar is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by Beckman Culture Life Sciences, a global leader in centrifugation and life science instrumentation. For more information on Beckman Culture, please visit Beckman.com. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. I encourage you to participate by submitting questions for our speaker at any time. To do so, simply type in the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. In the tabs across the top of the page, you'll find information on related applications, upcoming and on-demand webinars, as well as links to the Cell Culture Heroes page. You just may be our next Cell Culture Hero. Also, please notice you can share this webinar on your personal social media. Just click on the social sharing tab to let your friends and colleagues know about today's live event. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. With great pleasure, I now present today's speaker, my friend, colleague, and biophysical characterization expert, Akash Bhattacharya of Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. For Akash's complete bio, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Akash, you may now begin your presentation. Okay, thank you, Ross, for uh, that really nice introduction. And thank you, everyone in the audience who signed up to attend our webinar. This webinar is the first AUC webinar from Beckman Coulter Life Sciences in 2020. And the topic of this webinar is characterizing viruses from deadly pathogens to the workhorses of gene therapy. And we'll be covering a number of different topics, ranging from the biophysics of uh, characterization of certain components of viruses, all the way down to looking at empty full partial capsules in the gene therapy context. Before we get started, of course, I have to show you this slide, which has certain uh, legal disclaimers and statements. And then we can go on to the roadmap for today's talk. So first, we're going to talk about the biological characterization of viruses and discuss uh, in some detail what that might actually mean. And then we will go on to three different case studies. The first case study involves the application of sedimentation velocity AUC to study the SARS-CoV-2 main protease. This is, of course, an extremely important system at this point in time. The second case study looks at uh, the application of sedimentation equilibrium AUC experiments to study the behavior of viral fusion proteins also a very important uh, subject in the public health context. And finally, the third case study looks at um, examples where scientists use AAV along with, uh, sorry, use AUC along with several other analytical tools to optimize the production process in a gene therapy workflow. And then we will summarize what we've discussed. Okay, so, Characterization of viruses. So, uh, you know, you all heard that old statement that uh, if you're talking about something and it looks like a duck and it quacks, quacks like a duck, it must be a duck, right? However, you're not talking about ducks, you're talking about virus particles. And if we are looking at, for example, an HIV virus, if it looks like an HIV virus, quacks like an HIV virus, it must be an HIV virus, right? That does raise the question, what do we mean when we say quacks like an HIV virus? So this, of course, is the, um, the crux of the question. What does it really mean to characterize a virus? Now, if you are characterizing a virus, one of the things which you might be doing is uh, looking at functional assays. In other words, is the virus infecting the organism that it's supposed to be infecting? And you do that by a functional assays like plot counting and so on and so forth. The other is you look at the components of the virus. Now, a virus is essentially some form of um, genetic material, DNA or RNA, 
and it's usually associated with some form of protein coat. So you would look at the genetic material, the genome, using some form of nucleic acid amplification, perhaps with new PCR experiment, and you would look at the proteins which come along with it by using perhaps um, SP plot, using an ELISA, using something as simple as an SDS page. And then it goes beyond functional and component characterization. You talk about characterizing interactions. And now you're actually looking at something more interesting. You're, you're perhaps thinking of how do protein-protein uh, interactions between the virus and the host cell occur, or how do protein-nucleic acid interactions occur. And that's an entirely different type of question to ask and uh, requires a whole battery of instruments to answer such kind of questions. And that's kind of the region where we first want to focus our efforts. We want to talk about interactions, protein-protein interactions for the most part. Now, I'm going to jump ahead a couple of slides very quick. Okay, the technique that we are going to be using in all of the case studies that we're going to talk about today is analytical ultracentrifugation, or AUC. Now, analytical ultracentrifugation is a solution phase, native state, hydrodynamic technique, which looks at the sedimentation of analyzed particles under a very high centrifugal force field and tracks the movement of these particles as they move down the sample sector in an AUC cell and interprets that movement in order to get the size, the mass, and the shape of the analyzed particle. And you'll recognize immediately that if you have the size, the mass, the shape of the analyzed particle in an AUC experiment, you basically have the essential elements to find out almost everything you need to know about the equilibrium thermodynamics of this system. In other words, if you have a question about the oligomerization state of the analyte, you can answer it. If you have a question about the binding constant between, say, protein A and protein B, you'll also be able to answer that. So AUC really is an extremely versatile tool which allows you to answer all kinds of biophysical questions in this context. Which now brings us to case study number one, and that is the SARS-CoV-2 main protein. So as we all know, SARS-CoV-2 is uh, uh, the source organism behind the COVID-19 pandemic, which we are in the middle of right now. And therefore, a tremendous amount of uh, scientific expertise has been devoted to finding out everything that we possibly can about this causative organism. And one of those studies uh, is the basis for our uh, case study today. This is a paper published a few months ago in the Journal of Science. And this paper talks about the crystal structure of SARS-CoV-2 main protease. And uh, it used structural studies as well as biophysical studies, including AUC, to discuss the development of uh, inhibitors of SARS-CoV-2. So, the importance of this is, of course, it's vital because um, the main protease of the SARS-CoV-2 virus is an essential protein in the viral life cycle. So in other words, if you find a mechanism, a drug candidate perhaps, which inhibits the action of this protein, then you may be on your way to actually finding a treatment for COVID-19. And uh, of course, in the context of understanding how an in inhibitory um, drug candidate for the main proteins of SARS-CoV-2 might work, you actually have to understand the protein itself. That is to say, you have to understand the main proteins of SARS-CoV-2 on a structural level as much as you can. And you also have to understand its interactions from the biophysics perspective as much as you can. You have to, in other words, answer questions like, is this a monomer or is this a dimer? And uh, is there, for example, the propensity for a dimer to form during the life cycle of the virus? So, um, summarizing what we've talked about so far, the main viral protease, uh, frequently called CCN-PRO or M-PRO, 
of SARS-CoV-2 is a very attractive drug target. This is a protein essential to viral replication. In other words, if you throw a spanner in the works and prevent this protein from properly functioning, then you might be able to develop a drug candidate against COVID-19. Uh, Zhang and co-workers used sedimentation velocity AUC to characterize the dimerization behavior of this protein. And this, of course, is an essential step in developing viable drug candidates. So the protein by itself, uh, a couple of crystal structures have been uh, solved and published. And as you can see, uh, these structures are shown out here. The protein by itself is a uh, 33 0.8 kilodalton protein. It exists in the dimeric form, and a couple of views of the dimer are shown here. So, Zhang and co-workers, they carried out sedimentation velocity experiments where they uh, ran an increasing concentration of the SARS-CoV-2 main protease, which is uh, M-PRO, and they uh, asked the question, does this sediment as a monomer or does this sediment as a dimer? And what they found was that the monomer, which uh, as you can see sediments at 2.9 Redford, gradually converts into the dimer with sediments at 4.5 Redford as you ramp the concentration up. In this, they uh, tried a series of concentrations going from about 0.23 micromolar all the way to 18.1 micromolar. And when they went to 18.1 micromolar, they really had almost, I would say, like 90% of this is actually a dimer. And that's really very interesting because it tells us that uh, this protein does in fact dimerize. So what can we do with this? What they did using this experiment series is that they uh, then went ahead and asked the question that, okay, so it dimerizes, can we actually go ahead and find a binding constant for this? And they did in fact. So the binding constant that they were able to find for this system turns out to be about 2.4 micromolars. And this is derived from the same data set that you saw in the previous slide. Turns out that this binding constant is actually kind of similar to the binding constant of the main protease originating from the first SARS-CoV virus which was discovered about a decade and so ago. So the two uh, viral proteases from these two um, different but related viral viruses actually behave kind of similarly. So what does this mean going forward in terms of drug development? AUC was one of several techniques which the authors used in the study that they published. So what they were trying to do was use a bunch of um, in silico and in vitro techniques in conjunction to this uh, to design better inhibitors of this drug. Now, if you're trying to inhibit a drug, uh, I'm sorry, if you're trying to inhibit a protein, in this case, the main protease of SARS-CoV-2, you're going to be running some kind of kinetic studies and some kind of pharmacokinetic studies to actually figure out whether your drug candidate is doing what it's supposed to, that is, is it actually inhibiting the target protein? Now, in order to do that, you need to know how much target protein you have in the assay that you're using for finding out whether this drug is effective or not. Now, that is fine. You think you know what, uh, uh, how much protein you have going in, but if the protein is itself capable of dimerizing, and as it turns out, the dimeric form of this protein is the catalytically active form, then you need to know how much of the protein is actually catalytically active in your drug assay and how much of it is inactive, because that really tells you whether your drug is inhibiting or whether it is not. And again, this is something where Zhang and co-workers used AUC to find out that if they were doing assays at one micromolar, they would have 21% of the protein catalytically active. And if they were doing assays at two micromolars, they would have about 38% of the protein catalytically active. And using that information, they tested 
the different drugs that they were looking at, and they found a drug candidate which inhibited the recombinant SARS-CoV-2 main protease with an IC50 of about 0.67. Then they used that information further and they did some in vivo studies as well, where they found that this drug candidate is promising and they are moving forward further and hopefully uh, using this as a um, lead candidate for developing an actual inhibitor. So this case study in summary, it's important really tells you that analytical ultrasimplification is an extremely powerful tool which can be used for characterizing components of viruses. And specifically, it can be used for addressing questions which are related to the discovery of novel drugs against these viruses. So with that being said, let's move on to the second case study. And the second case study is all about viral fusion protein, and it uses a slightly different experimental technique. So let's uh, put the context of the second case study together. This is an experiment uh, carried out using sedimentation equilibrium, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But first, the biological context. Viral fusion is an essential part of the viral life cycle for, say, something like uh, the various influenza viral strains out there. Therefore, studying the process of viral fusion is really important because if we know what are the different viral proteins which are involved in the process of fusing a virus to the host cell membrane, then again, we might be able to develop a therapeutic intervention which can prevent that fusion process and therefore actually prevent viral fusion uh, and therefore prevent viral infection. And that's exactly what uh, motivated the authors behind this study in which uh, Webb and coworkers, they looked at a number of different viral systems and asked the question of what's really happening to the transmembrane domain of the viral fusion protein. Now let's break that question down and see what it really means. And I just told you, membrane fusion, which we have shown over here in this cartoon, is this process where the virus interacts with the host cell membrane, fuses with it, and then dispenses the content of the virus inside the host cell. And again, understanding this process is the key to blocking this process and therefore blocking viral infection itself. And this process occurs via the interaction of various viral proteins with host cell proteins on the cell membrane surface, which are called receptors. And specifically, the system that we are going to be talking about is the viral fusion protein, and even more specifically, its transmembrane domain. So viral fusion proteins are this um, extremely complex arrangement of a protein structure which sticks out from the viral membrane surface itself. But there's also a part of that protein which is embedded inside the viral membrane, and that is the part which is shown to the right of the figure between the red dots over here and the blue dots over here. And this system, as a matter of fact, is uh, actually derived from the influenza viral fusion protein. So structural information about what's happening to that part of the viral fusion protein, which is sticking outside of the viral membrane, is has been investigated by many scientists, and there is quite a bit of information out there. Structural information about what's happening to the transmembrane domain, which is shown now in this bracket, that's not very widely available, and uh, that is the exact system which Webb and coworkers looked at in this study. 
So the technique that they use is called sedimentation equilibrium. Now, sedimentation equilibrium experiments are a different type of AUC experiment as compared to sedimentation velocity. They are called equilibrium experiments because they are run at somewhat slower speed. And when you run an AUC experiment at slower speed, then you may have the situation where after a while, the sample analyte actually forms an exponential distribution inside the sample cell. That is to say, as you gradually go outwards in radius, you have more and more samples piling up and the distribution curve is completely exponential. And the thing is that this situation occurs because the centrifugal force has been balanced out by the diffusion and therefore the system is actually in an equilibrium and taken as a whole, the sample is not sedimenting continuously towards the bottom of the tube. In other words, you're not having a pellet gradually accumulate at the bottom of the tube. And the curve that you see over here, this curve can be fitted with the appropriate constraints to provide an extremely accurate value of the analyzed molecular weight. Therefore, if you have an analyte which is a, a monomer of a protein, it's going to be fitted to a particular value. If you have an analyte which is completely trimeric, then it's going to be fitted to a different value. If you have a mix of these two, then you will be able to find out uh, using a number of different experiments where you essentially run a titration series, you'll be able to find out the, um, the equilibrium uh, between the monomer and the trimer in great detail. So, what Webb and co-workers did was they made these chimeric fusion proteins where the transmembrane domain of TM shown in light blue belongs to the specific viral system that they were looking at. For instance, they looked at rabies, they looked at influenza, they even looked at Ebola. But the um, attached sort of surface exposed domain, that was a um, universal domain which they used for all of these chimeric systems. So the idea behind that is that any interaction that they saw in their equilibrium AUC experiment would therefore be attributed only to the transmembrane domain because that is different between these different chimeric proteins and not to the surface exposed domain. And the different systems that they studied included Ebola, rabies, influenza, and as a matter of fact, SARS-CoV fusion protein as well. And this is just an example of one of the various data sets that they looked at. So what they found here for influenza is that their equilibrium experiments demonstrated that there's a one is to three or one is to three is to six equilibrium for transmembrane domain depending on the species and the pH. So the importance of this is significant. What this study tells you is that the transmembrane domain of the viral fusion protein is actually involved in an allosteric action in and of itself. And it is perhaps the trimerization of these transmembrane domains which should be targeted by a therapeutic intervention. So to summarize this case study, understanding the biophysics of viral entry is really important in designing a drug intervention which can disrupt this process and therefore prevent viral infection. In this paper, Webb and coworkers, they found that the transmembrane domain of viral fusion proteins of the different systems that they studied which included rabies, Ebola, influenza, and SARS-CoV-1, all of these systems display some form of allosteric interaction and a 
sort of a governing model for these appears to be the formation of trimers and sometimes hexamers depending on pH. This is really interesting and exciting because it tells us that if you can design a drug which can prevent this trimer formation, then that drug might be a good candidate to prevent such viral infections. Okay, which brings us to case study number three, which is all about gene therapy. Now, gene therapy and specifically the study of adeno-associated viruses is uh, something in which AUC is widely used. So let's talk about this system and uh, embed the biological context. Uh, the case study itself comes from this paper published a couple of years ago by Joshi and co-workers in Methods and Clinical Development. So the context for this is this. Gene therapy is a extremely active area of research and the number of clinical trials which are currently in play has increased from uh, something which was barely um, one or two a couple of decades ago to the hundred today. And in these clinical trials, uh, the use of adeno-associated virus or AAV as the gene therapy vector of choice is also becoming more and more widespread um, every year. So let's talk about um, gene therapy and the use of viral vectors and sort of uh, at a high level encapsulate what this is all about. The idea over here is that you have some kind of a therapeutic transgene which you have incorporated into a viral vector which is a sort of a carrier. Now the viral vector therefore has some viral DNA and also has some of the therapeutic transgene inside of the viral DNA. Now when the viral vector is uh, introduced to the target cell, then the viral vector enters the target cell and eventually the, the viral vector capsid breaks down, releasing the gene inside of it to the host cell. Now the genes inside the viral vector, of course, include the therapeutic transgene and that therapeutic transgene is used by the host cell to make some kind of protein, which then treats the disease condition. So really, um, in a very hand-waving sort of a way, it's the equivalent of that old saying that you give a man a fish, he eats for an afternoon. You teach a man to fish, he eats for a lifetime. The idea behind gene therapy being that you don't just provide a small molecule drug to the patient, you actually train the patient's body to defeat the disease condition. And the mechanism we use to train the patient's body to do so is the therapeutic transgene. And the mechanism by which you deliver the therapeutic transgene to the patient's uh, cells, which need it, is the viral vector. So adeno-associated virus, or AAV, is one of the most popular viral uh, vectors for gene therapy um, in current use. And to give you a very high-level uh, introduction to what AAV is, it's a 4.7 kilobase single-stranded uh, DNA genome. And the capsid is made up of three proteins, VP1, VP2, and VP3 in a one is to one is to 10 ratio with about 60 monomers, the entire thing has a mass of about 3.7 megadalton. So existing production methods of AAV yield something like 10 to the 13 viral genomes per liter. A phase three trial can require um, 
a lot more viral genome. And um, therefore, the uh, question is that, how do we improve the yield of viral vector production for gene therapy? So in this case study, Joshi and co-workers, they, they used something called the fed batch bioreactor system. Now, the essential idea behind the fed batch bioreactor system is really quite simple. You try to increase the density of the manufacturing cell system, now, whether that's uh, HEK293 or whether it's some kind of um, SS9 baculovirus system. Uh, the basic idea is that you increase the density of this manufacturing cell system by spiking the growth culture with nutrients at various time points. And in doing so, you end up with a much larger output of virus particles. Now that's great. However, just having a large output of virus particles is of course not enough. You need to know whether those virus particles are actually bioactive. In other words, are they actually going to be useful in the gene therapy context? And that is really the question for which um, AUC was employed by Joshi and co-workers. And that's what we're going to be talking about. So we are back again to that original question of it looks like an HIV virus, quacks like an HIV virus, so it must be an HIV virus. In this case, we are, of course, not talking about an HIV virus. We're talking about an AAV virus. So that earlier question now breaks down to another component where it looks like. We're now going to focus on this part of the sentence. So what do we mean when, it, when we say it looks like? Looks like would typically be interpreted in terms of whole particle structural lamps. Now this could be electron microscopy. This could be some technique focused on particle sizing, some technique focused on mass determination, or even shape determination. Now electron microscopy is of course an image-based technique. The idea being that you image the virus particles, and you try to find out as much as you can by interpreting those images. What if you had a way to find out everything you need to know about particle size, its mass, and shape using one experiment, which was in the native state? And remember, electron microscopy is not, and in the solution phase. And even more importantly, when you're characterizing not just any old virus but specifically a viral vector, then the all important question which you have to ask with particle sizing and mass is the question of loading efficiency. And what do we mean by that? What we mean is that the virus particles that you're studying, are they in fact carrying the complete genome that they should be, or are they carrying a partial genome or are they just empty virus capsule? So the Optima AEC is the preferred technique in viral vector quality control. And this is an example of a data set where an Optima AEC experiment, a sedimentation velocity experiment, was used to distinguish between empty capsids, shown here on the leftmost sedimenting at 60-ish, 65-ish spreadbooks, and partial capsids which are about 75-ish spreadbergs, and full capsids, which are a uh, shade about 90 spreadbergs. And the separation, as you can see, is down to baseline. In other words, there is no overlap between MPs and partials and full capsids. And the importance of this is uh, something that cannot be overstated. I mean, the FDA has stated that Viral particles that do not contain the therapeutic gene are unlikely to have therapeutic activity. However, these particles themselves might produce an adverse allergic response. And this is really important. When you're doing a gene therapy drug trial, you really want to treat the patient with as many therapeutically bioactive particles as you can, as you can and don't want to give the patient empty virus capsules. So this is where AUC comes in and this is where AUC shines. So let's look at what AUC does in this specific case study. 
The Optima AEC data can be used to identify the percentage of empty caches, and this is a useful metric for AV quality control. So, in this case study, our, um, uh, the authors, Joshi and co workers, they used the SF9 cell culture system and they grew cells in the normal or low density bioreactors, purified everything, analyzed the genome by CTCR, and then asked the question how many of my virus particles are actually full? And then they did the same with the high density or fed batch bioreactor shown in the bottom panel. And the fed batch bioreactor, of course, is distinguished by the nutrient spikes which are added to increase the overall manufacturing cell density. Again, purify the viral vectors. When they did the qPCR analysis, they found that there's a six-fold increase in viral genome concentration. And when they did the particle analysis by AEC, they uh, found that the viral particles being produced have largely the same empty full ratio as the uh, normal or low density bioreactor system. So what are they talking about really? This is what their traces look like. The 67S uh, species that they found is uh, the empty viral capsule. And the 98 or 95S species that they found was the full viral capsid. So the first thing that they found was that the empty capsids are between 62 to 67 S. And this is the range of variation that you get going from low density or conventional growth to a high density or fed batch growth. They also found that the fully loaded capsids Sediment between 93 and 98 S. And finally, they found that the percentage of capsules which actually have the full genome load is about 74% for low density and about 80% for the high density fed batch. So, this is a really good result because what it tells them is that the use of high density or fed batch growth process, while it gives you more virus particles, it does not give you more empty virus particles. It gives you largely the same kind of virus particles, empty full ratio that you would get with the conventional process, which means that there's really no downside to a high density growth. And a high density growth might be the best way to get the um, total amount of viral vectors that you really need for a phase three trial. So it's important, finally, is that AUC helps to optimize AAP production conditions and to maximize productivity. Okay, so let's summarize everything that we spoke about. The Optima AUC data offers a unique way to characterize viruses in the solution native phase, either as whole particles or looking at the different components of viruses. In case study one, we discussed the use of sedimentation velocity AUC data to determine the fraction of catalytically active dimer for SARS-CoV-2 main protease. This information was used to optimize the kinetic study. In case study number two, we discussed how sedimentation equilibrium data has been used to demonstrate that the transmembrane domains of viral fusion proteins such as an influenza or an Ebola or an rabies, are implicated in some form of oligomer organization. Now, this helps us understand the mechanism of viral infection much better, and it also tells us which type of viral infection might be a useful target for drug-based intervention. And case study number three, uh, we discussed how the authors use the AUC data in determining the fraction of loaded genomes for AAB viral vectors produced by a fed batch or high density growth system. And they compared this to AAV produced by the conventional or low density growth system. What they found that the high density growth system gives them largely the same fraction of loaded particles. 
And this is very useful in optimizing growth conditions to maximize the production of viral vectors. A few additional resources. Some of our previous webinars are available at this link. For more info, also look at this resource that we have called SpinSight. And we have more webinars coming in fall 2020, as well as a mini symposium series with guest speakers from academic and industry labs. And I want to thank everyone for your time and your attention. Okay, thank you, Akash, for your great presentation on uh, the in-depth um, uh, analysis of these viruses and their characterization. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. As a reminder, uh, please submit questions by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. So let's get started with the first question. So Akash, is it better to do an equilibrium experiment or a velocity experiment if I'm trying to find the KD? Well, it kind of depends, Ross. If you're, um, so for what it's worth, when you're trying to find the KD, ultimately what you are going to need is uh, you're going to need to have a binding isotherm. And on a binding isotherm, uh, I mean, if you think of what a binding isotherm graph is like, you've got an increasing concentration of the titrant on the x-axis, and you have got the fraction bound on the y-axis. Now, how are you looking at the fraction bound? That's the question, right? If you're looking at the appearance of a particular species, which you know as this is the bound species where uh, proteins A and B have come together to give you a system AB, then you can just see, um, you can just track the appearance of this bound species via a velocity experiment. And uh, as you titrate an increasing amounts of say B or A, you generate your binding isotherm and get your KD. On the other hand, the rationale for using an equilibrium experiment would be that you very specifically want to identify your bound species, the AB species, by molecular weight and nothing else. And this is because equilibrium experiments are really very good at determining molecular weight. Um, in fact, they're probably the best way to determine molecular weight in an AUC context. So if you want to go that way, then you would track the appearance of the AB bound species and know very specifically by its molecular weight that it is absolutely AB and it is not, for example, um, AB2 or um, A2B. And that would allow you to determine the KD with great accuracy. Okay, thank you for the response on, on that. Um, the next question we have is asking a broader level, but uh, how many types of viral vectors are being used right now for gene therapy? Okay, so uh, uh, there are quite a few different options in, in that regard, really. So adenovirus is, of course, one of the most popular um, viral vector systems which are being used for gene therapy. And adeno-associated virus is also a very popular system. But apart from that, people have also uh, been running trials with vectors, vectors and uh, uh, you know other lentivirus vectors as well. And uh, as far as I know, some other systems, including herpes simplex virus, have also been tried. And as a matter of fact, uh, people have even tried uh, to just use naked or you know plasmid DNA without an actual encapsulation vehicle for uh, gene therapy as well. So number of different systems are in play for this. Great. Um, so we've got a couple questions coming in, it looks like, around the different types of viruses as an add-on to that. So I'll, I'll combine a few okay. here. Um, but the first sure. part being, um, what's the difference between adenovirus and adeno-associated virus in gene therapy? And as a follow-up to that, um, why is adeno-associated virus seeming to be most common and prominent for gene therapy? Okay, so I'm going to uh, preface my answer with the caveat that uh, you should talk to someone who is a full-time virologist to get the exact information that you need. But yeah, we can try to point you in the right direction for some of these answers. So adenovirus and adeno-associated virus are both fairly popular vector systems for gene therapy. Uh, adenovirus, and, and as you 
as you can surmise, adeno and adeno associated virus are actually related in terms of replication cycles and in terms of infection cycles. So the reason why one would want to use adeno virus is it accommodates fairly uh, large size therapeutic transgenes and uh, they can affect both replicating as well as non-replicating cells. And uh, the reason why one would want to use adeno-associated virus is that AAV viruses are, um, first off, they're basic, they, they apparently are not very pathogenic. So um, that's an important criterion in terms of uh, inducing some kind of allergic response, although that is, that is up to a certain amount of debate and there's a lot of ongoing research in that area. Um, AAV viruses can infect non-dividing cells as well as dividing cells. And um, one of the most important things is that AAV viruses are capable of integrating into the host cell genome at a very specific site on chromosome number 19. And this is a desired feature because um, it's predictable, right? I mean, it's not like, for instance, a retrovirus which may end up giving you a random insertion or mutagenesis, and you might not know where that is. You'd have to work harder to track it. But AAV, you know that it's going to go to chromosome number 19. Uh, that's one of the big advantages of AAV. And of course, there is a small disadvantage to AAV, and it uh, comes from the fact that the AAV virus is actually a kind of a small virus. So the uh, overall size of the genome that you can, the therapeutic genome that you can stick inside it is actually limited. Okay, great, good response. Over to you. Um, yeah, thank you. So uh, another question is following up on something that you mentioned earlier in your presentation where you were mentioning the importance of knowing uh, empty partial full ratio and they're just looking for a little bit more information on why it's so important to really focus on the full particles. Why it's so important to fully focus on the full particles, right? So, uh, yeah, let's let's talk about this. So, when you're um, when you're providing gene therapy treatment to a patient, then what is it that you're providing? I mean, you're providing a therapeutic transgene, and that therapeutic transgene is supposed to make certain proteins which treat the disease condition, right? However, the therapeutic transgene is carried in via a delivery vehicle, which is, at least in, or in origin, is a virus. So if you're going to be treating a patient with a delivery vehicle, which is a virus, so regardless of how much effort has been put in into trying to find something which is as non-pathogenic as possible as the delivery vehicle, there is always the chance that there will be some kind of an immune response. So you want to minimize that immune response. You want to maximize the therapeutic effect, and you want to minimize the adverse allergic effect. So therefore, you want to deliver a drug product which is as much therapeutically effective as possible so that you can you deliver the min minimum amount of virus particles into the patient's body that you can get away with. So that is why if you're delivering some kind of a drug product, which is perhaps just 20 or 25 percent full capsid and 75 percent perhaps empty or maybe partial, then that is a situation where, um, you know, perhaps you could try to do better. I mean, if you could reverse the ratios and you could, you'd end up delivering something that is 70 or 90 percent full capsid, then you wouldn't have that many non-bioactive particles being delivered into the patient's body, which might induce an allergic response. And again, it's important to remember that the number of virus particles that you're introducing into a patient's body, if that number is something like, um, there have been some trials in which I think that number has been 10, uh, 11 um, viral particles per kilogram of body weight, so, uh, or even more. So you're, you might end up with a situation where you're actually delivering maybe a quadrillion virus particles to a patient's body. And if you're doing that 
and you have an uh, adverse allergic reaction, then extremely nasty effects could happen. I mean, sepsis could follow and um, you might have a really bad outcome. And the point of using a good quality control experiment to ensure that you're delivering as much bioactive particles as possible and uh, minimizing the allergic response has extremely visible real life effects in terms of patient outcomes. And it is absolutely something that you should be doing. Over to you, Ross. Okay, great. Um, so the next question that's coming in is asking it, why is there such a trend um, towards trying to increase the yield of the viral vector in these um, different productions? Increase the yield of the viral vector. Um, so uh, it just turns out that uh, making virus particles is uh, expensive. And um, um, if you're, we actually, and I actually spoke to a virologist some time ago who mentioned, who literally whose statement was that um, virus, viral vectors are more expensive than gold. You can get gold if you pay for it, but sometimes you cannot get viral vector because it is that hard to make. So yeah, it's um, whether you're doing a large scale therapy where you're trying to treat a lot of people or whether you're making a, a therapeutic attempt which is really on the lines of personalized medicine, you have to get the cost down as far as possible. Viral vectors um, and gene therapy treatment in general really is at the cutting bleeding edge of, of state of the art biotechnology today. This is really not something which is available to um, people in the third world who do not have the kind of economic resources which would allow them to have these treatments. And yet it is also perhaps one of the most promising developments in uh, medicine and biotechnology in the last three decades. So it is incumbent upon us to make every effort possible to bring the cost down so that this kind of treatment might be more widely available. And of course, the first step in bringing these costs down is to actually make more bioactive viral vector particles. And in that context, the effort by Joshi and coworkers in this fedback schematic design is really great because they got this amazing increase of uh, density of the producer cells. They also got an increase in the number of viral concentration of viral genomes. And best of all, turns out from their analysis that the viral particles that they are making with the fedback system are as bioactive as you would make with the conventional low density system. And they also have the same packing fraction, more or less. So that's really great, right? So yeah, you, absolutely. Um, so as kind of a, a follow-up to what you had just mentioned with the Joshi paper, um, there's someone asking for a little bit more detail on what a fed batch process looks like. Okay, so uh, you know what we'll do? Uh, we'll send, uh, when we send out our follow-up email, uh, we'll send a link to that paper. I believe it is freely available for download. So you'll find all of the details that you need about um, uh, density at the point of infection and exactly what kind of nutrients were put in and what kind of process monitoring system was available. Uh, yeah, we'll just send you the link to the paper. Okay, perfect. Um, so another question is a little bit more of a situational example, but this person says, I'm trying to set up a binding isotherm series of experiments to determine KD for my protein, but I'm not able to reach the low concentration range that I need to access because there's not enough signal. What can I do? Okay, excellent question. I mean, if you're trying to set up a binding isotherm, then, I mean, you know that if you're doing a proper binding isotherm, you at least need to be one order of magnitude above and one order below of the KD in, you know, otherwise you're binding isotherm um, in the logarithmic scale just won't look like um, a proper S-shaped curve um, and the results won't be reliable. So this is what you do. Uh, you have the advantage of picking the detection wavelength of uh, interest. So if you have a system where uh, you're looking at the absorption 280 nanometers, which of course comes from the tyrosine tryptophan uh, side chains of protein, and uh, you see that you just don't have enough signal coming out of there when you're going to lower concentrations, then uh, you should consider switching over to 
detecting the peptide bond itself. And um, 230 nanometers is a great wavelength to use because it's kind of close to where the peptide bond is, although not exactly. And at the same time, it responds to a fairly bright peak on the xenon flash lamp, which is the light source for the Optima AUC. And that will allow you to uh, access the lower concentration values. Of course, I strongly suggest that you do a bunch of UV vis measurements on a cuvette to make sure that you're able to correlate the 280 and uh, the 230 uh, nanometer measurements in order to you know, establish linearity in your dilution series. And uh, correspondingly, if you have to go to higher concentrations, then just start measuring off of the 280 nanometer peak. I mean, measure at 290, for example, uh, the extinction coefficient is going to be lower over there. Okay, good feedback. Um, next question is, is there any experimental situation where equilibrium gives more information than velocity for AUC? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, so, so here's the thing. Uh, equilibrium actually does not give you the shape information that a velocity experiment does because it is an, I mean, ultimately, you, not the diffusion information uh, because diffusion and uh, centrifugal source have actually balanced each other out and everything is in equilibrium. Uh, so what you do get is the ability to get molecular waste out of the system with really great accuracy. In fact, the most accuracy that you can in an AUC experiment. But there's something else. There are certain systems for which uh, you could try spinning as hard as you can go, which is 60,000 RPM, as fast as you can spin. And you really won't get good quality sedimentation data. In fact, at the end, all you might end up getting is a exponential um, looking curve. And that just tells you that there are certain things which are going to be better analyzed via equilibrium experiments. You know, really small peptides, for example. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, so another is a relatively short question, but how much uh, AAV sample might you need for this? Okay, so um, this is what you're going to have to do. Uh, you're going to have to convert your um, particle count, which is you probably have something in, uh, you know, 10 E12 or 10 E13 particles per mil. That's maybe your concentration in the stock tube that you have. You're going to have to convert that to an absorbance number, and you're going to have to measure the absorbance at 280 and at 230 nanometers. So if you're doing an absorption experiment, um, absorption detector AC experiment, and you choose to detect at 230 nanometers, you would like to have maybe 0 0.7, 0 0.8 uh, absorption units at that wavelength. And remember, this is with respect to a uh, 1 centimeter or a 10 millimeter path length. So just do the conversion, and that's the concentration that you need. And regarding how much you need, for a typical AUC experiment, you would want to have maybe 400 to 450 microliters worth of sample. Okay, sounds good. Uh, the next question is asking about um, comparing and, and contrasting a bit sec malls, um, which provides molar mass information compared to AUC. Can you speak to that, Akash? So SECMOS is, uh, I mean, SECMOS is a really great technique. It's a complementary technique to AUC. Uh, and you get really good uh, information regarding molar masses. The thing is that AUC is pretty much unparalleled in its dynamic range. I mean, AUC is probably the only technique which will give you an accurate estimation of molar masses of systems ranging from the size of a single peptide all the way to an intact virus. So, you know, something maybe like 100 Dalton all the way up to the tens of mega Dalton. So five-ish orders of magnitude. I don't think there are very many techniques out there which give you that kind of dynamic range. That being said, the caveat, of course, is that I'm not necessarily saying that you will get that information in a single experiment, although there are people who've designed extremely clever multi-speed experiments in which even that is possible. But yes, AUC does offer you an enormous dynamic range in terms of measurement, which I don't believe SecMOLs can actually access. Okay, thank you, Akash. It looks like we have time for one more question. Um, so this is a higher level question related to our current uh, state of the world. 
Um, what do you see as the role of gene therapy or viral vectors um, for COVID-19 response? Ah, again, a very interesting question. So I think there are some um, um, vaccine trials which are currently ongoing, uh, which use um, gene therapy-based systems or in general, adenovirus or AAV-based systems. So uh, I, I, I'm speculating just a little bit over here, but one of the um, ideas behind building a vaccine is that you introduce some kind of a viral particle into the patient's body, and the viral particle has um, these spikes engineered upon its surface, which are actually related to the spikes of the disease-causing virus that you're trying to uh, vaccinate against. So in other words, you have a basic viral capsid, but that basic viral capsid is actually presenting um, SARS-CoV-2 spikes. So which is why understanding uh, what the SARS-CoV-2 spikes uh, look like is actually super important. And so the virus that you're developing has what you might think of if, as a viral chassis, and then these decorations upon its surface, which are actually engineered to induce an immune response, which is basically going to give you antibodies and therefore vaccinate you. And one of the chassis, or viral chassis, if you want to use that word, which is used for this purpose is actually adenovirus. So it's definitely a system which uh, um, finds use in both gene therapy as well as in vaccines. Yes, absolutely. There's a, definitely a lot of crossover in, you know, in terms of what, you know, vectors are being used for gene therapy and, and vaccines for COVID and others, as, as you mentioned. Um, so, again, Akash, thank you uh, for taking the time to discuss um, virus characterization. Um, I'd also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Beckman Culture Life Sciences. Before we go, I'd finally like to thank the audience for joining us today and participating with all these great questions. There are a number that we didn't have time to get to today. Um, and those submitted also during On Demand will be addressed by the speaker, Akash, um, via the contact information that was provided at the time of registration. When the re webinar is recording is available for replay, you will receive an email from LabRoots, and I encourage you to share that recording with any colleagues who may have missed today's live event. I hope to see you again at our upcoming webinars, and until then, take care. Thank you, everyone.